Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be going through the foundation content that you need for your AQA GCC Physics Paper 2. So this is really low key, this is really chilled, we're going to be taking it all step by step. Now once you've done this, you can go up to the website, you can have a look at the predictive papers or the walkthroughs of the predictive papers that we've written for this year. physics we learn about scalar and vector quantities. A scalar is a quantity which has magnitude only, so it only has a size associated with it, whereas a vector has both that magnitude but also direction. So in physics we might often see vectors represented using an arrow and the size or length of that arrow gives us an idea of the size of the quantity and the direction it's pointing tells us the direction of it. Now at GCSE, of course, we learn about so many different things. Now, I've got this little table here just to summarise whether certain things you've learned about are scalar and vector. So we need to know that speed is a scalar, whereas velocity is a vector. Distance is a scalar, whereas displacement is a vector. Time and energy are both scalar quantities as well, because they just have a size associated with them, not a direction. Whereas acceleration, force and momentum, all of these things we will learn more about are all examples of vectors. All forces are either contact forces or non-contact forces. Contact forces are experienced when objects are physically touching. Some examples of this include friction, where things are rubbing against each other, air resistance, where the air is in contact with you, tension, and also the normal contact force, and there's loads of other ones too. Non-contact forces, on the other hand though, involve objects that are not physically touching, they're physically separated, and yet they're still experiencing a force between them. So some examples of this include magnetic forces. If you've ever held two magnets together, you'll be able to feel, even though they're not touching them, pulling together or pushing apart, even though there's no physical contact. As well as this, we have electrostatic forces and also gravitational forces. Now, don't forget that force, whether we're talking about contact forces or non-contact forces, are vector quantities. So they always have the magnitude, but also the direction. The weight of an object is the force acting on it caused by gravity. That means that the weight of an object is dependent on the gravitational field strength. In fact, if we were to have our weight on planet Earth, then we were taken to the moon or something which has a smaller gravitational field strength, our weight would decrease. We need to know that the weight of an object is directly proportional to the mass of an object. And the equation that links them is weight equals mass times gravitational field strength, where weight is actually a force measured in newtons, mass is measured in kilograms, and G, or gravitational field strength, is measured in newtons per kilogram. Now, a really, really common misconception, and it's because of our everyday language, is that our weight is the same as our mass. But it isn't, it isn't at all. And actually, when we say that we weigh ourselves, or we weigh this amount, that's incorrect. It's actually our mass that we are talking about. So we need to get our head around the fact that in physics, weight is the force in newtons. If we want to measure the weight of an object, we would use something called a newton meter or a calibrated string balance. It's also important that we know that weight is considered to act at a single point, the center of mass of an object. Lots of forces can act on an object. However, we can replace all of these different forces with just a single force called the resultant force. Now the resultant force is just a single force that has the same effect as all of the original forces acting together. Let's have a look at what that means. So if we had a four Newton force and we added another four Newton force in the same direction to it, there would be a resultant force equal to eight Newtons in that same direction. However, if we had a six Newton force, and it was encountering another six Newton force, but in the opposing direction. Because force is a vector, we could say that this is actually minus six Newtons. 
what's going to happen then is these two forces are going to cancel each other out. And so actually the resultant force is equal to zero. Make sure that you can do these yourself as well because they could ask very similar questions in the exam. A force does work on an object when the force causes the object to move through a distance. The work done by a force on an object is given by work done equals force times by distance, where work done is measured in joules, force is measured in newtons, and distance is measured in meters. Of course, as always, we could use a little cheeky triangle here if you struggle with the algebra. If not, I would always recommend that you just rearrange this using the algebra that you've learned in maths. But it's always good to have something up your sleeve in case you get stuck. If you did use a triangle, I would just pop a W on the top for work done and force times distance on the bottom. Now, we need to know that one joule is equal to one newton metre. And this is because one joule of work is done when a force of one newton causes a displacement of one metre. It's also really important that we know that work done against friction will result in a temperature increase. And this is why if you rub your hands together, they start to get warm because you've done work against friction. When a force acts on an object, the object may bend, compress, or stretch, or some combination of all of these changes. To change the shape of a stationary object, there must be more than one force acting on the object, like you can see in these diagrams here. So for example, to squash a plastic bottle, we must push the sides of the bottle together. Changes in shape are called deformation, and we need to know about two types of deformation, elastic and inelastic. Now this table here summarises the differences between those two. Elastic deformation is reversed when the force is removed. For example, an elastic band that gets slightly stretched will just ping back to its original shape when you remove the force. Elastic deformation, on the other hand, is not fully reversed when the force is removed. And we see that there's been a permanent change in shape. A good example of this is a plastic bottle that's been squashed, or even perhaps an elastic band that you've stretched too far and now it's no longer stretching back. The extension of an elastic object is directly proportional to the force applied to it, provided that the limit of proportionality is not exceeded. Now this is called Hooke's law. The force applied to extend an elastic object by an extension E is given by force equals spring constant times by extension or F equals K times E, where F is the force measured in newtons, K is the spring constant measured in newtons per metre, and E is the extension measured in metres. Now this relationship also applies to springs that are compressed. However, in this case, the E isn't going to be the extension, it's going to be the amount that the object is compressed. So now let's think, if we plot force against extension, we will expect to see if Hooke's laws be being obeyed, this direct proportion, this straight line, it will go through the origin and it will have this constant gradient. And in fact, we can calculate the spring constant by finding the gradient of this line. So the change in y over the change in x. The limit of proportionality is the point at which Hooke's law is no longer obeyed and the extension is no longer directly proportional to the force applied. Now we can really clearly see this on a graph. As you can see here in this graph, you can see we've got a straight line for the first part of it, so this region here. However, beyond this limit of proportionality, we no longer have that linear relationship between force and extension. And that is when we know we have exceeded that limit of proportionality. So the elastic limit of a material is the furthest point it can be deformed and still be able to return to its original shape when that force is removed. And when a material passes its elastic limit, its deformation becomes inelastic. When a spring is compressed by a force, work is done on the spring and elastic potential energy gets stored in that spring. Now the elastic potential energy stored in a stretched spring is given by elastic potential energy equals half times the spring constant times by extension squared, or EE equals a half times K times E squared, where our elastic potential energy is measured in joules, the spring constant is measured in newtons per metre, 
and the extension is measured in metres. Now if the spring has no inelastic deformation, we can say that the work done is equal to the elastic potential energy. In physics, we're going to see the words distance and displacement used really often. However, to your everyday person, you probably wouldn't think there's any difference between the two words. However, there is, and we need to know that difference. So distance is a measure of how far an object has moved. However, it gives us no information at all about the direction that the object has moved. Now, for this reason, distance is a scalar quantity. Displacement, on the other hand, tells us the distance an object has moved, but it also tells us the direction that it has moved in. That means that displacement is a vector quantity. Speed is a scalar quantity. That means that it does not have a direction. The speed a person can walk or run depends on lots of different factors, such as age, fitness, distance travelled and terrain. However, unfortunately, we need to know an approximate average speed for certain different activities. We need to know that when walking, the average approximate speed is 1.5 metres per second. When running, the average approximate speed is 3 metres per second. And cycling, the average approximate speed is 6 metres per second. So make sure you learn those key facts. The speed of sound and wind can also change dependent on the conditions. We need to know that the typical speed of sound in air is 300 metres per second. The distance travelled by an object moving at a constant speed for a specific amount of time is given as distance travelled equals speed times time, or S equals V times T. Now, of course, if you're not too confident, you could always turn this into a nice little triangle. This is going to look something like this, where the S is going to be on the top, and then you have B times T on the bottom. So long as you get the marks, I am happy. So remember, distance is measured in metres, velocity is measured in metres per second, and time is measured in seconds. Now, velocity is a vector quantity. Velocity is just the speed in a given direction. If an object moves along a straight line, the distance travelled can be represented by a distance time graph. The gradient of that distance time graph gives us the speed of the object. And if the graph shows a straight line like we can see in this diagram, we know that the object is moving at a constant speed. And the steeper the line, the faster the speed. However, if the curve on the distance time graph slopes upwards, and the gradient is getting steeper with time, we can see that the object is accelerating. On the other hand, if the curve on the distance time graph slopes downwards and it gets less steep over time, then we can say that the object is decelerating. Average acceleration of an object can be calculated using acceleration equals the change in velocity over time taken. We could see it written as A equals delta V, where the delta means change, over T. So the acceleration is measured in metres per second squared. The change in velocity is just measured in metres per second, just like any old velocity. And time is measured in seconds. Objects that are slowing down are said to be decelerating. And an object that is decelerating has negative acceleration. Remember, acceleration is a vector. The fact it can be positive or negative gives us that direction of the acceleration. If an object moves along a straight line, the velocity can be represented by a velocity time graph. Now the gradient of the velocity time graph gives us the acceleration of the object. If the graph shows a straight line, then the object is moving at a constant acceleration. And of course, the steeper the line, the greater the acceleration, because we've got this larger gradient for steeper lines. Now, if the curve on a velocity time graph is curved, then the object's acceleration is changing. If, however, we have a horizontal line on a velocity time graph, then that tells us the object has constant velocity. If an object moves through a fluid, a gas or a liquid, initially it's going to accelerate just due to the force of gravity. However, as it falls, resistive forces will start to increase. 
until eventually that force of gravity, the weight, will become balanced with those resistive forces. This means that there's no overall force, no resultant force, and terminal velocity has been reached. Now all that terminal velocity means is it's that constant velocity it is now falling under. So make sure that you familiarise yourself with this phrase of terminal velocity and you understand what it means. Newton's first law states that if the resultant force on a stationary object is zero, the object will remain stationary. However, if the resultant force on a moving object is zero, the object will continue moving in the same direction with the same speed. When we have an object moving at a constant speed, the driving force will be balanced by resistive forces such as the friction and the air resistance. That's what gives it that resultant force of zero because they're balanced and therefore it just continues in the same direction with the same speed according to Newton's first law. Newton's second law tells us that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the resultant force acting on the object and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Now as a little top tip, make sure that you remember that this symbol here represents proportionality Looks a bit like a little fish, and this like squiggly equals sign means approximately. Now Newton's second law gives us this very important equation. Resultant force equals mass times acceleration, or F equals M times A. Remember, we could use a triangle if you find it difficult to rearrange these equations. Anything that's going to get you the marks. If we did use a triangle for this, then we would put the F on the top, and the m times a on the bottom. Don't forget that force is measured in newtons, mass is measured in kilograms, and acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. Newton's third law tells us that when two objects interact, forces that they exert on each other are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So here, let's have a look at this diagram here. A man is pushing on a wall, so he's got the force of his push. However, the wall is going to exert an equal and opposite force back on that man. And that is showing us Newton's third law. Stopping distance is the sum of the thinking distance and the braking distance. So it's the distance in total that it takes for you to stop from the moment you see an object to the moment you stop, okay? So the thinking distance is the distance that the travel thinks during the driver's reaction time. So imagine you're driving along and you see a rabbit run into the road. The thinking distance will be the distance that you travel between the moment you see that rabbit to the moment you put your foot on the brake. And then the braking distance is the distance the vehicle travels under the braking force. So that is the distance you travel from the moment you put your foot on the pedal to the moment you're stationary. So for a given braking force, Greater speed is going to cause greater stopping distances. The typical reaction time of a person is between 0.2 seconds and 0.9 seconds. Make sure you learn that fact. Now, there's a few things that can affect the reaction time of a driver and therefore the thinking distance traveled. The reaction time can get affected by tiredness. The more tired you are, the longer your reaction time the use of drugs, the use of alcohol, and also the presence of distractions. So for instance, loud music, things like this can distract you and increase the reaction time of the driver. We need to be able to describe a method to measure human reaction times. So here we go, okay? So first up, ask a person to sit at a desk with their hand out. Hold a ruler up to their hand and line up the zero on the ruler with the person's thumb and forefinger. So now you're going to tell the person that when the ruler gets released, they need to catch it as quickly as possible. So now we're going to drop that ruler, but we're not going to tell the person. And we're going to measure the distance travelled by the ruler in this time before they can stop the ruler. So now we have enough information to calculate the final velocity of the ruler. We can use the equation for constant acceleration that states that v squared equals u squared plus 2as. We know that u is equal to zero because it started stationary. s is the distance travelled by the ruler that we measured. 
And A is the acceleration caused due to gravity, which we could use 9.8 meters per second squared or 10 meters per second squared. A question would give you a number to use if you needed it. So now you're going to use that equation to find B. And once you know what B is, you can calculate the time taken using the equation that says that acceleration equals change in velocity over time. Of course, we'll need to rearrange it to get time as the subject. Time would be equal to change in velocity over acceleration. But once we've done that, we can just substitute in the values that we already know to get that time. So once we do that, we will finish off by carrying out some repeats and calculate a mean. To ensure this experiment is calculated correctly and we're actually just working out those human reaction times, we need to make sure that we carry this out in a room with no distractions that's going to affect that reaction time. The braking distance of a vehicle is affected by the road and weather conditions. So if we have poor road and weather conditions such as icy or wet roads, we're going to increase the braking distance. Braking distance also affects on the vehicle conditions. So if we have poor vehicle conditions such as worn tyres or worn brakes, again we're going to increase the braking distance of the vehicle. Now velocity also affects braking distance and we need to know very particularly if velocity doubles the stopping distance actually increases by a factor of four. It doesn't just double two, it increases by a factor of four, so make sure you know that. Now when a force gets applied to the brakes of a vehicle, work is done. Now the friction between the tires and the brake pads causes the kinetic energy of the vehicle to decrease and the brake pads to increase in temperature. Ultimately, the faster the vehicle travels, the greater the braking force required, and therefore the greater deceleration that we have. Now, of course, we need to know, well, what is dangerous about a greater deceleration? We need to know that the brakes can overheat under these conditions, and the driver may lose control of the vehicle. So make sure you know those dangers. Waves can be described as oscillations or vibrations about a point. The direction of the vibration can differ and this is what determines the type of wave. Waves can be transverse or longitudinal and in a transverse wave the vibrations are at right angles to the direction in which the waves transfer energy. However with a longitudinal wave the vibrations are parallel to the direction in which the waves transfer energy. Now, this can be a bit confusing. If instead we think of it in terms of a long string like a slinky, and we think, what can we do with this slinky to turn it into a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave? And if we wanted to make a transverse wave, we would want to take that slinky and move it up and down and up and down and up and down. Now, if you think about it, the waves are moving forward, but the vibrations, your hand, are at right angles to that forward direction. Longitudinal waves, on the other hand, if you had that same spring or slinky and you wanted to make a longitudinal wave, you would bump it back and forth with your hand. And there, your vibrations, that movement of your hand, is parallel to the direction in which the waves transfer energy. Now, for ripples on the surface of water and sound waves in air, we need to know that it's not the water or the air that's traveling, it is the wave. So if we think, for example, about a stone that is dropped into water, we can see that ripples are produced. 
However, neither the water nor the stone move with the ripples. It's just the wave. If we also think about someone speaking, in this case, the voice box will be vibrating, making sound waves that will travel through the air. However, that air is not moving. We need to ensure that we can label a transverse wave and recognize its shape. So the transverse wave, as you can see here, looks like your very typical wave, up and down and up and down. Now, the tops of each of these waves is called the peak, the bottoms are called the trough, the height from the equilibrium position to the peak or the trough is called the amplitude. Make sure that you don't say it's from the peak to the trough. That's a very common mistake. And the wavelength is the distance between two identical points on the wave. Now, an easy way to do this is going from peak to peak or trough to trough. So here, another wavelength that we could draw on would be this position here. It is identical to the wavelength labelled on this diagram, but perhaps it's an easy way to identify it. So some mechanical waves are transverse, for example, water waves and seismic S waves. In addition to this, all of the electromagnetic waves that we will learn about in more detail, for example, ultraviolet and infrared are all transverse. Now, longitudinal waves look like this. Longitudinal waves have compressions, which are regions of high pressure, where the particles are close together. And they also have rarefactions, which are regions of low pressure, where the particles are far apart. Now we'll find that some mechanical waves are longitudinal. These include sound waves, ultrasound, and also seismic P waves. We need to make sure that we can describe waves in the following terms. We need to make sure that we know that amplitude is the maximum displacement of a point on a wave from its rest position. The period is the time it takes for a wave to complete one cycle. Wave speed is calculated using wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Frequency is the number of waves passing a point per second. And wavelength is the distance between a point on one wave and the next point on the same wave. Now, wave speed is the speed at which energy is transferred through a medium. And, as we've seen, we can calculate this using the following equation. Wave speed equals frequency times by wavelength, or V equals F times lambda, where lambda is a Greek symbol used to represent the wavelength. Now, wave speed is measured in metres per second, frequency is measured in hertz, and wavelength is measured in metres. Now, if you're doing physics instead of combined science, we also need to know that when waves travel from one medium to another, the wave speed and the wavelength may change, but the frequency will always stay the same. The period of a wave can be calculated using the frequency of the wave. So period is equal to one over the frequency. This can be written as T equals one over F, don't forget that the period is the time it takes for a wave to complete one cycle. So period is measured in seconds, whereas the frequency is measured in hertz. It's also important that you remember that we might need to find the frequency given the time period. Now, if this was to occur, we would simply rearrange the equation and this would look like F equals one over T. So a really easy one to rearrange there. And we might be asked how to measure the velocity of sound in air. Now, an experiment that we could do to do this would be to have two people stand a large distance apart, for instance, 100 meters, use a trundle wheel to measure that distance between them because it's too large to use a meter rule. Now get one of these people to make a loud noise. So perhaps they could bang together two wooden blocks or bang together some cymbals. And the other person is going to have a stopwatch. And you're going to ask this person to start the stopwatch when they see the person make the noise and then stop it when they actually hear it. Then we're going to repeat this experiment and take an average, take the mean. We're going to use the following equation now to calculate the speed of sound in air. So we know that wave speed is equal to distance, which could be that 100 meters. And then we divide it by that mean time that we calculated it takes 
for the person to hear the noise. We could also be asked how to measure the velocity of ripples on water surfaces. So to do this, set up a ripple tank and add water to it to a depth of about five centimetres. Now we want to adjust the height of the wooden rod so that it is just touching the surface of the water. Now we're going to turn on the motor and the lamp so that we can observe low frequency waves. Now we want to measure the length of several waves and divide by the number of waves to find the wavelength. This is going to be more accurate than just measuring one wave. Now we want to count the number of waves that pass the point in 10 seconds and divide by 10 to find the frequency. Finally, we can use the equation that wave speed equals frequency times by wavelength to calculate the wave speed. Electromagnetic waves are transverse waves that transfer energy. They form a continuous spectrum, which means that they're just one giant range of waves with varying wavelengths and frequencies. As you can see down here in this diagram, We've got this long wave which goes from radio wave to microwave to infrared to visible light to ultraviolet to x-rays to gamma rays. Now we need to know these in order, okay? Now there's a mnemonic that can help us do this. There's loads of mnemonics actually. I'm going to give you one but by all means make your own or find one that you really like. I like to use this one which is that rabbits meet in very ultra expensive gardens. Absolute nonsense, but if it can help place our different electromagnetic waves in order, then that's all I care about. We need to know that the radio waves here have the longest wavelength, the lowest frequency, and the lowest energy of all of these waves. Whereas on the other end of this spectrum, the gamma rays, we have the shortest wavelength, the highest frequency and the highest energy. So make sure that you learn all of these and you know their properties. You know that they're transverse waves, they transfer energy, and they all travel at the same velocity through a vacuum or air. Electromagnetic waves can be refracted when they move from one substance to another. This means that the wave changes direction. We can use ray diagrams like the one you can see here to show the refraction of a wave at the boundary between two substances. Electromagnetic waves can be generated or absorbed because of changes in atoms and the nuclei of atoms. When the electrons in an atom will move down energy levels, as you can see in this diagram, they will emit electromagnetic waves. Now some electromagnetic waves are more hazardous than others. For instance, UV rays, X-rays and gamma rays can all have hazardous effects on human body tissues. The effect that they will have depends on the type of the radiation and the size of the radiation dose. Radiation dose is a measure of the risk of harm resulting from an exposure of the body to the radiation. Radiation dose is measured in sieverts and we should know that 1,000 millisieverts is equal to 1 sievert because we'll often have to convert between the units. Electromagnetic waves become more dangerous as the frequency of the wave increases. This table here shows some of the potential dangers that we need to know. So we need to know that microwaves can cause the internal heating of body cells. We need to know that infrared can cause skin burns. Ultraviolet can cause damage to surface cells leading to skin cancer as well as premature aging. It can also cause damage to the eyes leading to eye conditions. Now x-rays can cause mutations and damage to body cells again. And gamma rays can also cause mutations and damage to body cells. We need to know the uses of our different types of electromagnetic radiation. So radio waves can be used for broadcasting, satellite transmissions and communications. Microwaves can be used for cooking, also satellite transmissions and communications. Infrared can be used for cooking, thermal imaging and also short range communications. Then we get to visible light, which includes of course the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet colours. This is used for vision and also for photography. Ultraviolet now, 
is used for security marking, fluorescent lamps, and also disinfecting water. X-rays are used to observe the internal structure of objects. We can have medical X-rays and also airport security scanners. Gamma rays, on the other hand, are used for sterilizing food and medical equipment because they're able to kill bacteria. They can also treat and detect cancer. This topic starts nice and simple. We remind ourselves that magnets have north and south poles. North poles get represented by an N and south poles represented with an S. We should know that magnets will attract magnetic materials such as iron, steel, cobalt and nickel. We should know that like poles will repel and different poles attract. And of course, don't forget that magnetic forces are examples of non-contact forces. Permanent magnets produce their own magnetic field, which will always be there. Induced magnets, however, become magnetic in a magnetic field. Well, what is a magnetic field that we're talking about? Because we're going to use this concept a lot in this topic. A magnetic field is a region around a magnet where a magnetic material or another magnet will experience a force. And we represent these magnetic fields using magnetic field lines. We need to be able to draw and recognise the magnetic field pattern around a bar magnet. This diagram here shows it perfectly. So we will see that magnetic field lines will always point from north to south. This is really important. The closer the field lines, the stronger the field. And the magnetic field strength you'll notice, certainly because they're closer together in this diagram, is at its strongest near the poles. As we move away from the magnet, the magnetic field strength decreases. In the exam, we might be asked how to plot a magnetic field, and we can do this using magnetic compasses. So our first step is you're going to place the compasses around your magnet on a piece of paper. We will then mark the direction that the needle points onto the paper. And then finally, we join these points together, and this will show the field lines. Magnetic compasses that we use to work out direction actually contain a small bar magnet. And when these magnetic compasses are not near to another magnet, they're actually going to line up with the magnetic field of the Earth. And this is really important because this tells us that the Earth has a magnetic core. It tells us that it's made of a material which is magnetic. Now, actually, the geographical South Pole of the Earth is actually the magnetic North Pole and vice versa. When a current flows through a conducting wire, a magnetic field gets produced around that wire. As you can see in these diagrams, they form little concentric circles around that wire. And the strength of the magnetic field that gets made depends on the size of the current going through the wire. So the bigger the current, the bigger that magnetic field, and also the distance from the wire. The closer to the wire, that stronger that magnetic field, and the further away you get, the weaker it becomes. We can also increase the strength of the magnetic field made by a wire by curling it into a solenoid, which looks just like this. The magnetic field around a solenoid actually ends up being very similar to the magnetic field around a bar magnet. The diagram here shows what that magnetic field around a solenoid looks like. You can see that inside the solenoid it is strong and uniform. We can see it's uniform because the magnetic field lines look evenly spaced and we can also see that they're close together inside that solenoid 
which is what shows that it's strong. The magnetic field is stronger inside the solenoid compared to outside because all of the small magnetic fields caused by the current in each of those turns will add up, causing a greater overall magnetic field. If we wanted to increase the strength of the magnetic field around a solenoid even more, we can add an iron core, and this makes an electromagnet. You may be asked in the exam, what are some advantages of electromagnets compared to other magnets? So one of the really important differences is that we can switch electromagnets on and off, simply by turning that current on and off. Now, you might think, why would this be useful? But if we look at the diagram here, imagine we're in some scrapyard or we're moving around old scrap cars or something. It's much easier if we can use this magnetic force, turn on the electromagnet, attract our magnetic materials and move them using that force, and then turn it off and release them. Another great advantage of electromagnets is that the strength of the electromagnet can be adjusted simply by changing the current. If we increase the current, we get a stronger electromagnet, whereas if we have a permanent magnet, the strength of that magnet is just the strength of that magnet. We might see some applications of electromagnets come up in the exam. So let's have a look at this specific example of an electric bell and let's see how electromagnets can work. Now looking at this, if we close the switch, we will turn on the electromagnet because the current can flow through the circuit. Now of course, looking at the diagram, you can see we've got this iron armature. This is going to get attracted to the electromagnet and this is going to pull the hammer towards the bell and they're going to hit each other and it's going to sound the bell. However, of course, when this happens, we've broken the circuit and that turns off the electromagnet. This means that the armature is no longer attracted towards the magnet and it's going to move back to its original position. But by moving back to its original position, it's completed the circuit again. And so we're going to have this process just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, on repeat, sounding that bell. Now this is one application. We could see loads of other ones too. So we just need to make sure that we can apply these principles to any little example they might give us. Ouch! This is why in some videos I write explain scratches.